today's video is going to talk about genetic counseling. Specifically, all of these rules and, and inheritance patterns are great to know, but how does it affect us? What do we do with the information? And so what most people want to know is, what is my likelihood of inheriting certain traits? What did I get from my grandma, my grandpa, and what can I pass on to my kids? And so we do this through genetic counseling, specifically th through the production of pedigrees. So you might have heard pedigree like dog food. What they mean is the dog is like a purebred, it's a winner. We know its traits, we know its genes. So a pedigree is a way of mapping an organism's genes. Specifically, it shows one trait's inheritance throughout several generations of a family. You can kind of think of it like a family tree that also contains genetic information. So when we make a pedigree, there's a number of guidelines we do so that anybody who's familiar with how pedigrees are made can look at it and figure out very easily the traits. We don't need to have a whole like paragraph upon paragraph of grandma had this and grandpa had that and so forth. We can just see from a graphic. So to make the pedigree, there's several rules. The first one is within the pedigrees, each line on the pedigree represents a generation. So anyone drawn on that, on that line is the same generation. We label each generation with Roman numerals so that we can refer to, instead of saying the first generation of the grandparents, well, if there's six generations, who's the grandparents to whom? So the easy way to do it is to do it with Roman numerals. We also then, as individuals, we number them one to two and three with regular numbers, Arabic or number you know, one, two, the way we write in math, um, to indicate each individual. So that rather than saying Uncle Billy, you can say, three, four, Roman numeral three slash four, the fourth person on the, on the pedigree. Um, whenever possible, siblings are listed in chron chronological order, with oldest on the left and youngest on the right. However, occasionally if you're mapping two families that were joined by marriage, so maybe like your mom's side and your dad's side, sometimes, if ideally, you would put them in chronological order still. Sometimes we flip the order around just for ease. But if you want to keep keep following all the rules. You put them in chronological order. So if we look at this pedigree. Here we have four generations. So you could think of this like great grandma and great grandpa, their kids, their kids, and then their kids' kids, so their great grandkids. That gets a little tough. So if I wanted to refer to, say, this person here, I would refer to one, two, so generation number two, and the fifth person in. So I would say this is Roman numeral two, Five or two, two dash five. Um, in this way, we can very easily refer to people. It's important to note that the generations are about who's the offspring of who, not how old people are. So, for example, my grandparents didn't have kids until they were in their forties, and my parents didn't have kids until they were in their thirties. Didn't have me until they were thirty-five. My cousins' side, my mom's cousins. Well, they all had kids in their 20s, her, her aunt and uncle, and then her cousins had kids in their 20s, and their kids had kids in their 20s. So in my family, um, my third cousins, or second cousins twice removed, or Lord knows how we call it, people who are a generation lower than me on, on the family tree, on the pedigree, are actually my age. But because I am in this generation, and they're the next generation down, even though they're my age or older, they would go down here, and I would go up here, because my parents are here, and their grandparents are here. So it's all about who's the offspring, not your age. But within the family, we would expect this person to be older than that person. And there are a number of symbols that we use in the pedigree so that we can very easily look at something like this and know who's a girl, who's a guy, who's got the trait, who doesn't, and so forth. So these are them. Males have a box. Females a circle. If a sex is unknown, so for example, um, my, my sister-in-law knows that her grandma was one of ten kids. She doesn't know how many boys and girls there were, just that there were 10 kids. Then the ones that she doesn't know what sex they were, she'd put a diamond. Another example would be if somebody's pregnant and they haven't determined the sex of the baby yet, they'd also put a diamond. Um, if somebody has the trait, they would fill in. So whatever trait you're mapping, whatever it is they're filled in, that means they have it. It could be recessive, could be dominant, they just have whatever it is you're talking about. In this case, it's a circle that's filled in, and so it would be a circle that's, it would be a, a filled in circle, which means it's a female that has it. If someone's pregnant, we put it in uh, dash marks. If they don't know the sex, it's a diamond. If they've done a test and they know that the sex is a boy or a girl, then they would do a circle in dash marks or a square in dash marks. If someone's passed away, we draw a line through them like that. And so in this case, it would be a male who's passed away. 
A carrier, remember, is a heterozygous individual. So they have the allele, they can pass it on to their kids, but they themselves don't have it. So carriers are only used for recessive trait because the dominant person, if they have it, they would express it. So if an individual is a carrier, a lot of times we fill them in like this, halfway. Keep in mind that not all carriers are marked. So some of the problems you'll see, you'll have to determine whether somebody is a carrier and it won't be filled in for you. So you'll have to determine whether that's the case. If somebody has been adopted, of course we need them in the, in the pedigree because they're part of the family. But we need to indicate that their genetics has not been affected by anybody in, in prior generations. So we put them on the, on the uh, pedigree, but we put a bracket around them like that to indicate that. If two people have produced an offspring, we join them with a line between them, so in the middle of their shapes like that. Their kids then come down from this T. If somebody is just married and they haven't had kids yet, we would not include this, this line here. Um, offspring then are listed like this. So these two, we have a, a circle and a square, so this means that these two people, this is the dad, this is the mom, had this person who's a daughter and this person who's a son. And the fact that their, their line comes up off the top and connects like this, that means they're siblings. If two people are born at the same time, remember, we list them chronologically. So this person is on the left because she's first. Well, if two people are twins, they're born at the same time. So we come off of this sibling line here at the same time by making them have a triangle. If they're identical, we want to indicate that because their genetics will be the same. And so identical twins are drawn like that. Sometimes the line connecting them is down here. That's okay. To me, that makes it look like they're married, so I like the line a little bit above it, but it's fine if you do it the other way. I've seen it both ways. Many times individuals will have multiple mates. Could be a marriage and remarriage if you're talking about animals. Of course, not all animals um, mate for life. And so you would draw it like this. In the case of humans, of course, usually that means that these two people are, are not together anymore. And these two people are. They're currently married. So um, whether or not you include uh, exes, on the pedigree all depends upon your preference and whether or not offspring have been produced. So for example, um, my cousin has a baby, or I guess he's six now, uh, but my cousin has a baby and the, the father has never been in, in, in the baby's life. Nobody considers the father family. We wouldn't want to put him on our pedigree, but his genetics contribute, contributed to their son. And so we'd have to put him on the family. Many of his traits would be unknown or a question mark because most of us haven't met him, except for, obviously, my cousin. Um, but we have to put him on there because he, he contributed genetics. My brother was married for a very brief time um, when he was very young, and they did not produce any offspring. So I would not include her in my pedigree because she has her gen she's not in the picture anymore, and her genetics did not factor into my family at all. Just a reminder, once again, a carrier is an organism that's heterozygous for a recessive trait. So we often talk about it as a synonym for heterozygous, but a carrier is only for a recessive trait because what a carrier means is that they have the allele, they can pass it on to their kids, but they themselves don't express it. And so it would be for a recessive trait only because otherwise if it was a dominant or incomplete dominant or co-dominant, at least it would be partially expressed. All right, let's look at this one, a very simple uh, pedigree. We have two generations indicated by these numbers. And dad, mom, four kids. Hitchhiker's thumb, that's when your thumb goes way back. I don't have it, but some people bend back like that. Um, hitchhiker's thumb is recessive. So if we look at the dad and the kids, if they're filled in, that means they have a hitchhiker's thumb. It's recessive, so they have to have two little T's. Now, if we then try to figure out what the rest of the family has, let's look at mom. Mom, or 1-2, is heterozygous. I know this because mom has to have a little allele to give to her daughter and her son that have the hitchhiker's thumb. These kids had to get one from mom and one from dad, so mom has to have one to give it to. But she has to have a big T because she herself does not have one. Her son and her daughter, 2-1 and 2-4, they too are heterozygous for an opposite reason, or for a similar anyway. They both uh, do not have a hitchhiker's thumb, so they'd have a big T for mom. But we know they're heterozygous rather than homozygous because dad only has recessive alleles to give them. 
Here's another example, much larger. This one's three generations. Congenital deafness, one form of it. There's many different kinds. But one form of deafness is caused by a trait um, that is recessive. So if we look at this two, generation two, one, two, three, four, two, four is deaf. So he would have two little d's because it's recessive. This person, when he knows, he's adopted, but nevertheless, he also has two little d's because it too, um, is re he too has the, uh, the phenotype. Their daughter does as well, so three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, three, eight would also be homozygous recessive. If we look in this case, carriers are indicated. And so because this person is filled in, we know that anyone who's not filled in has to be homozygous dominant because otherwise if they were a carrier, they'd be indicated. So we can go ahead and put big D, big D under all of the people who are not filled in. Heterozygous, we got to add this person in. We know that that woman is um, heterozygous because she's a carrier. So if we look at the rest that we have to fi figure out then, let's look at grandpa, one, one, uh, grandma, excuse me. So grandma, we know, has to be heterozygous. The reason we know this is she has a son whom she gave a little d, or a recessive allele. She also has a daughter whom she gave a big d, because this kid got big d from each parent, and this one got little d from each parent, which means both 1-1 one, one and 1-2, one, the grandparents, both have to be heterozygous. If we look at 2-2, two, two, this uh, woman also has to be heterozygous. We can't tell from her parents because two heterozygous parents can, can, can um, produce an offspring that has any genotype. However, we can tell from her kids. She's got two sons that are homozygous dominant, so she has to have a big D. She also, though, has a, son, a daughter who's homozygous, actually heterozygous, since her husband does not have any recessive alleles to give her daughter. She has to have the recessive allele to give the daughter. If we look at two, one, two, three, four, five, six, this woman has to be big, excuse me, has to have at least an allele for deafness because they've got a kid and their kid is deaf, so this person has to have gotten that from um, her mom. But we don't know without any further information whether that person is deaf or not. We'd actually have to find out what her phenotype is in order to figure it out. Same thing for this person. We know that the person's not deaf because um, we know that dad's going to give him a big non-deaf gene. But we don't know which one came from mom, so that person could be heterozygous or homozygous dominant. These kids, even though we don't have any phenotype information for them, we do know what their um, inheritance will be because their parents are homozygous. Dad only has little D's to give, mom only has big D's, so all three of the kids will be heterozygous. We can now take out the, the question marks and put the proper shading in and find out, um, f fill out the rest of this um, trait. I left one off here. We'd have to put this as big D question mark, just like we did little D, question mark little D, because we don't know for sure what um, those traits are. We only know either a little D or a big D, depending upon which one we're talking about. Dominant traits can, ex can be done on pedigrees as well. It's a little different. So Huntington's disease um, is, is a dominant trait that's very frequently mapped. On, on pedigrees. The reason why is Huntington's disease is a neurological disorder. It's very, very crippling. It's actually fatal, and it's, it's pretty much a horrible way to go. Your, your nerves break down um, a, a, over the span of a couple years. But unlike most fatal dominant diseases, it doesn't show up until people are already past reproductive age, usually in um, upper 30s or 40s at least. And so many people, if they don't have any genetic testing, could potentially reproduce before they find out that they have Huntington's disease. So um, in this case, because it's a dominant trait, we know all we know about them is they have a dominant allele. So anyone who doesn't have the trait, we know they're recessive. So we can go ahead and fill in all of their recessives. Notice, though, there's no carriers because there, there's no way to have the allele without expressing it. It's dominant, so if you have the allele, you're going to express it. So all of the people who are not filled in do not have Huntington's, and so they have the recessive non-Huntington's gene. P. 
people that are filled in, then once again, we have to look at their family to figure out what they are. So we look at one, two. She's got a kid who does not have it, but she herself has it. So she has to be heterozygous. If we look at two, one, we look at her, his dad. Dad had to give him a normal allele, but he has it, so he has to have gotten mom's Huntington's allele. When we look at their kids, same thing. Mom has to give them all the normal allele, but these two girls have it, so they have to have gotten dad's Huntington's allele. So this is basic pedigree work. Uh, in our next video, we'll look and see if we can take figure out from a pedigree whether a trait is dominant or recessive, autosomal or sex-linked. Join in later.